This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to this Razor COVID-19 special. I'm Emma Keeling. Some of you will have noticed more wildlife in your garden, parks and even urban areas. That's because of what scientists are calling the anthropause, the worldwide slowing of human activity which has led to many animals venturing further afield as we retreated inside. It's provided biologists with an opportunity to track wildlife before, during and after lockdown to measure the human impact. It's hoped this will reveal how we can coexist in ways more beneficial for man and beast. The world has been a quieter place during the pandemic lockdown. Many species have emerged to reclaim their habitat and researchers have been right on their tail. The project we, we launched uh, through the International Biologging Society looks at all species for which we can obtain data. So that ranges from very small creatures to whales, and it includes terrestrial and marine animals, as well as a lot of birds. We put out a call for collaboration to our research community a few weeks ago, and we got a phenomenal response to that call. And I think we are now up to 100 and 58 species covering 244 study populations around the globe. So it's a truly global collaborative research initiative. So what is biologging? I mean, how does it, how does it work? There are many different technologies, but it's uh, the basic concept is uh, to use these miniature, uh, really sophisticated electronic devices, which are attached to an animal in a very safe way. And uh, these devices record a range of data and uh, it differs from study to study, but typically biologists are interested in getting positional data and we use different satellite tracking systems for that. For example, GPS satellite tracking or Argos satellites. Uh, that tells us where the animal is in the landscape. But many of these devices are also fitted with tiny little accelerometers that tell us something about the activity of the animal, whether it's resting or whether it's moving. So this really provides a gold mine of information. Biologist Christian Rutz is the president of the Biologers Society. He says a positive example of the anthropause is deer who have become emboldened without human contact. Data gathered could help inform such things as road network design. There may also be species that are being put under increased pressure during this lockdown period. Uh, some of my colleagues have raised concerns, for example, about endangered species like rhinos and raptors being put at increased risk of poaching or persecution when human presence levels decreased in more remote areas like, like nature reserves and so on. There is no doubt humans do far more harm than good. We tend to think about our impact on the environment in terms of pollution, in terms of CO2, in terms of um, metal pollution of the ocean and these things. But actually, our one of our biggest impacts on the environment is just being there, doing the things that we do every day. And I think Chernobyl is certainly an incredible example of what happens when you take away the people. It was 1986 when the nuclear power plant exploded and the radiation fallout saw people abandon an area of around 4,000 square kilometres. Professor Jim Smith has studied the impact on wildlife. Just a few years after the accident, Belarusian and Ukrainian scientists noticed that the species associated with humans, so things like pigeons and rats, were disappearing because the humans had disappeared and wild species were coming back. So we expect to see some subtle effects of radiation in some of the hot spots in the exclusion zone. And we, indeed, we have seen some subtle effects. But now, 30 years on, the radioactivity is more than 100 times lower than it was right after the accident. And the wildlife seem to be coping very well and doing even better because the people aren't there. So they're adapting better to radiation than humans. We're actually, humans are worse than radiation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
I, I always say that the, the world's worst ever nuclear accident has done less damage to the ecosystem than than people just going about their daily business. So are you seeing um, you know, animals that were possibly very rare coming back in force and, and every, everything's just sort of really taking off? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean the, the, the first recorded increases were on things like wild boar who have a fast multiplication rate, so they reproduce quickly and, and their populations grew very quickly. Uh, elk, roe ro deer, uh, wolves increased. Um, and things like lynx, which have, uh, were very rare before the accident, white-tailed eagle, black stork, they weren't there before the accident, but after the accident, they've come back. From tragedy, scientists hope some good will come, and valuable data that will help policymakers and stakeholders make decisions that will work with nature. This is, of course, an opportunity to inform conservation science and to uh, to try and find ways of mitigating impact on, on wildlife. But there are bigger, much bigger objectives uh, related to this. Uh, objectives related to, to planning a sustainable future on this planet. There is increasing realization that we humans depend on a healthy environment. So ensuring that ecosystems are healthy and are functioning well has direct benefits for humans. So we hope that this biologging initiative will help us uh, come up with innovative and, and surprising, unforeseen uh, strategies for planning for a better future. Teams around the world are working on technology that could assist in the detection of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Early detection will be an additional tool to slow down infection rates and prevent a second spike before a vaccine is found. In Switzerland, a team led by Professor Jing Wang are working to create a biosensor that will be able to detect coronavirus in the air. So as we know that uh, these viruses could be transmitted through the airborne. So one of the uh, particular goals of us is uh, to monitor the air quality. And uh, for this, then we need to collect a certain amount of air and then these airborne particles need to be processed and carried by a certain agent to our sensing element. And then in our sensing element, uh, we could detect the amount of viruses in the air. So you need to have an interaction between the target you would like to sense and your sensing element. The RNA is basically the genetic code that is specific to this virus. So this is a very specific signal, and then, then you can detect this. And this piece of information is specific for this virus. And then by detection of this RNA, you know that this is your target. You are not getting a signal from something else. The key to how the biosensor works is detecting this unique RNA signal. Gold nano islands on a glass substrate contain artificially produced DNA receptors that match specific RNA sequences of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The technology used for detection is known as LSPR, or localized surface plasmon resonance, an optical phenomenon that occurs in metallic nanostructures. If the virus RNA passes over the DNA receptors in the gold nano islands, they bind together. This reaction causes a phase change in a light pointed at the nano islands, which is picked up by an optical sensor and shows the RNA strands in question are present. This is light signal before the target is being captured by the sensing element and after this capture. And then we compare this difference, and then from this difference, then we can quantify how many of these targets are being captured. So where will that biosensor be useful? We hope that the sensor can contribute to the studies of the transmission route. And obviously, this is also 
will be useful for uh, early warning, right? So if you go to a certain location, go to a train station, for example, you, you go to somewhere where you could have a lot of people, and then if our sensor can deliver this signal, and you see how oh, here the concentration of the virus in the air is very high, so so obviously you need to be careful. You try to avoid this uh, this space. The sensor has the potential to be used as an alternative to the polymerized chain reaction, or PCR test, that's used widely to test people for the virus. Someone who thinks they're infected would just need to blow into the sensor to give an instant reading. So we still need to develop this sensor more so that this sensor can be a deployable instrument in the field. And then we hope that, uh, that we can use this instrument to study the transmission of the virus and also contribute to early warnings uh, uh, control so that you can have better response to the, to the situation, you have early detection. And uh, so hopefully this will contribute to the, to the overall campaign against the, the COVID-19. Life moves pretty fast. Ideas move at the speed of sound. Technology moves at the speed of light. If you don't filter out the noise, you might miss the details. We pay attention to the details because they matter. Showing you a different perspective. See the difference. Don't forget you can sign up to our daily newsletter. We bring you all the top business headlines straight to your inbox. So sign up for free at this address. CGTN. See the difference. Over the last few decades, the rise of budget airlines and no-frills flying has seen millions of passengers sacrificing personal space for low-cost tickets. But as the result of the current pandemic, the aviation industry now faces a crisis. How can it continue in a world of social distancing? To answer that question, we need to take a look at the transmission dynamics of SARS-CoV-2. A study of a commercial flight in 1979 helps us understand how viruses can spread in confined spaces like planes. 54 passengers were on board and delayed for three hours before takeoff. At this time, the ventilation systems were not functioning. 72 hours after the flight, 72% of the aircraft passengers became infected with influenza, all from one infected passenger who had boarded the flight. Modern aircraft now use high-efficiency particulate air filters, or HEPA filters, to protect passengers from diseases. Cabin air is blasted through a 3D mesh of microglass fibres to capture microscopic particles and deadly germs. But can it protect us against the novel SARS-CoV-2 virus? The SARS-CoV-2 virus is microscopic, measuring approximately 125 nanometers in diameter, which is similar to other viruses like influenza. It's smaller than bacteria, which range widely in size but start from around 1,000 nanometers and a fraction of the size of a red blood cell or the diameter of a human hair. The gaps in the HEPA filter are large enough for a virus particle to pass through, but they are still caught by Brownian motion. Smaller gas particles are shot through the filter. These knock the virus particles around in a zigzag-like fashion increasing the probability of collision with one of the mesh fibres where it is then deposited. HEPA filters on board modern aircraft remove 99.995% of all virus particles and the air is recycled through the cabin 20 to 30 times every hour. Regular maintenance and replacement of the filters is required to maintain that level of efficiency. But HEPA filters are not the silver bullet to the prevention of virus transmission within aircraft cabins. 
Another well-studied flight, a Boeing 737 carrying 120 people, flew for three hours from Hong Kong to Beijing on March 15, 2003, where a 72-year-old man with SARS boarded the plane. The World Health Organization could only make contact with 65 people eight days after the flight, but of those, 22 were found to have been infected with SARS. The majority of those were located close to the 72-year-old man, indicating localised infection. However, infected passengers were identified throughout the cabin, and it's believed they had no contact with the infected person either before or after the flight. This has perplexed epidemiologists. The challenge facing scientists and the aviation industry is understanding exactly how SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted from an infected person to another person, which is more complicated than you might think. We know that SARS-CoV-2 is primarily excreted through respiratory droplets, which leave the mouth and nose. According to the World Health Organization, these droplets are relatively heavy, do not travel far and quickly sink to the ground. These droplets can land on objects and surfaces around the person, such as tables, doorknobs and handrails. People can become infected by touching these objects or surfaces and then touching their eyes, nose or mouth. This indicates that the likeliest spread of the virus is from touching contaminated surfaces where the virus can remain viable for several hours and sometimes days. For these reasons, airports and air cabins are being deep cleaned and in some cases radiated with UV light to kill the virus. Strict hand washing regimes are also being promoted to prevent transmission. But this doesn't give the full picture. A recent hospital study in Singapore looked at SARS-CoV-2 viral particles in samples taken from the air surrounding COVID patients. They found that virus particles were present in droplet sizes ranging from 1,000 to 4,000 nanometers, despite the hospital rooms having their air changed 12 times an hour. Droplets of this size can hang in the air for up to three hours, but limitations of the study meant they couldn't conclude whether these aerosol droplets were a possible route of transmission. However, one of the first animal studies of SARS-CoV-2 in golden Syrian hamsters has found that aerosol droplets was in fact a successful route for transmission. This controlled study is problematic for governments and industry wishing to reduce the two metre social distancing rule. If virus particles can hang in the air for up to three hours and continue to be infectious, then people need distancing and shielding to protect themselves. Ventilation systems must also not move infected air around. For this reason, the aviation industry is looking at methods of social distancing in the cabin, including removing the middle seat, but this would come at a high cost that would ultimately be passed on to the consumer. Alternatively, an Italian company called Avio Interiors has proposed a cabin redesign to help prevent localised transmission through aerosol droplets. Although an expensive investment, this would maintain passenger numbers and protect against any future pandemics. As the lockdown breaks are being lifted and people begin to travel again, the scientific community urges caution. Although huge advances have been made in our understanding of the novel SARS-CoV-2 virus, we still know very little about its transmission. There are few controlled studies and none in humans due to the deadly nature of the virus. We therefore rely on models based on similar viruses like influenza and observations from the current pandemic, which all have their limitations. The aviation industry will need to go to great lengths to prevent the spread of SARS-CoV-2 or risk contributing to a second wave. The industry will be closely scrutinised over the coming months as international travel takes off again. With some low-cost airlines already ignoring social distancing advice and filling the middle seat, only requiring passengers to wear masks, there are already concerns that not enough is being done.
Dr Paul Williams is a general practitioner from Teesside in the northeast of England. Once lockdown measures were put in place throughout the UK, he saw his practice disappear overnight. He told us that in a post-pandemic world, he hopes that things will never be normal again. The NHS went from being a busy service that was full of patients to all of a sudden nobody contacting us at all. And it was remarkable. It, um, it was a very, very strange period. Very quickly, the NHS became a um, sort of a, a, a digital first, tele telephone or video consultation service first. And I found that I was working all day, maybe having contact with 30 or 40 people, but only seeing one or two of them. Um, and that's the, the pattern that has now been very well established. As your GP practice goes forward, do you think you'll be doing more of um, consultations like this? I really hope that, um, that, that general practice, the primary care, moves to a, a, a digital first, telephone video first model. It, it's, first of all, it's so much more convenient for, for patients. The idea that the only way to be able to solve your health problem is to, is to pick up the phone and book a 10 minute appointment with a professional where you have to then travel to where they are, it just seems to me like something from the last century. And I'm delighted if people can fill in something online that covers their symptoms and what their expectations are of it being met and, and then if necessary, have a video consultation. Um, a, a small proportion of people do need to be seen face to face. There's really, there really is something about touching people, about being in the same room. There's something about what you get when a patient has their hand on the door ready to leave and they say while well, i'm here doctor and they mention some pain they've been getting in their chest or a, or a rash that they're worried about uh, you don't want to lose that you 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 need to be able to to use that sixth sense sometimes to get under the skin of what people have um, what's really worrying them and you can't always do that on a video but i think there's a much much greater place for video for for all kinds of digital technologies to be able to make health services better if you could say the one thing I've learned from this pandemic, what would it be? The one thing I've learned from the COVID pandemic is that you should never just focus on the, the physical elements of a, of a disease. COVID-19 is caused by a coronavirus, but it is having massive consequences for, for society. It's having all kinds of physical consequences. It's all having all kinds of mental health consequences. But the societal consequences, we, we talk about social health and social well-being, the societal consequences, the economic consequences, the relationships, the massive changes that we've had to make, make mean that you can, you can never think about a disease just as being the, the pathogen, the virus. A disease is a, a social construct, and, and COVID has demonstrated that more than any disease, I guess, has ever done that before. Once again, when we try to glimpse beyond the pandemic, we soon find ourselves in the realm of social science. This time it's economics. Universal Basic Income, or UBI, has been proposed as an alternative to current welfare models. It's not a new concept, but it's never been implemented. Since the pandemic, with millions of people losing their jobs, governments are taking another look at UBI as a possible way to ensure that no one has to live below the poverty line. There's been discussions about UBI over the past number of decades and then has obviously increased in the last few months with COVID-19 since so many companies have stopped paying people. People have needed uh, an alternative source of income. So with a UBI, if we were in this situation, people would just continue to get their universal basic income. It would be enough to pay their bills. It would be enough to keep them above the poverty line. On the one hand, you're seeing so much money being thrown at dealing with the economic crisis that COVID has thrown up anyways, that people are thinking UBI is supposed to be so expensive. It's supposed to be unaffordable. And yet in the, in the midst of this crisis, we're throwing all this money to do effectively the same thing, to provide people a basic income. UBI is often thought of as being unaffordable. 
but this is because estimates often just multiply the size of the UBI by the eligible population of a country. In reality, it would cost much less than this. Imagine a room with 15 people who want to set up a UBI for the room of $2 per person. The apparent upfront cost of the policy would be $30. But the 10 richest people in the room are asked to contribute $3 each towards funding it. After they each put in $3, raising the total $30 needed, every person in the room gets their $2 universal basic income. Because the 10 richest people in the room contributed $3 and then got $2 back in UBI, their real net contribution is actually $1 each, so the real cost of the UBI is $10. Other models suggest that money used to fund current welfare systems would almost cover the cost. And one of the things that I'm interested in is health. And so in many of the schemes, we find that there's improved health and especially mental health coming uh, as a result of people receiving a universal basic income. Why do you think mental health is improved with UBI? I think there's a number of reasons. The first is simply getting people out of poverty and the stresses that are associated with poverty. With that, that sort of stress, scientists see how that has an impact on the endocrine system in the body and causes damage that can lead to depression and other and anxiety and other mental health problems. Similarly, UBI helps to reduce inequality in societies. This is because it's universal. It goes to everybody and it helps people to achieve social mobility. So if someone thinks that they can't go back to university, or if someone wants to start their own business or endeavor upon an artistic or entrepreneurial career, at least they have that basic income to get them through that. And then finally, I think, and this, this is something that's emerged recently with respect to COVID-19, is that it helps people in terms of social isolation. So rather than just staying at home and hoping that the welfare check comes in, if everyone gets UBI, that kind of takes a lot of that uh, stigma away and that some of the shame and in terms of health, we have this idea of diseases of despair, the alcoholism, addictions, mental health problems that are associated with people who feel trapped and hopeless in their current economic and social situations. One of the main concerns people have about introducing a UBI is that people would take advantage of the scheme and not be motivated to find work. However, there's been little evidence from trials that this is the case. There's a pretty small number of people who don't want to make a difference, who don't want to be productive in some way, shape or form. It can be difficult for some to get to that point, but we need to be able to provide them the help to get there. COVID-19 and associated job insecurity has rekindled the idea, but the concept of a UBI is not new. First written about by Thomas More in his book Utopia in 1516, there have been numerous trial schemes around the world. In the 1970s, US President Nixon nearly introduced a variant of the basic income. However, the pilots were inconclusive and the scheme was scrapped at the last minute. In the 21st century, Due to an economic crash, the automation of jobs, and now a worldwide pandemic, a financial safety net is seen to be needed more than ever, and interest has surged. A trial that took place in Finland found participants to be more satisfied with their lives and experienced less mental strain, depression, sadness and loneliness. If you look at the cost of mental health, it's absolutely astronomical. It's such a major burden that we all have to face, not just in financial terms, but in emotional and social terms. And we're not very good at preventing mental illness. We tend to focus much more on treating it. And yet that's not the efficient way of doing it. So I think with experiments like the Finland one demonstrating that there have been positive outcomes in terms of mental health, that's one really clear thing to measure in future pilots to see if it does have this benefit and demonstrating that this can make a major financial benefit to societies. Some of the mental health and health benefits could, could really be the, the thing that gets it across the line. 
that's it for this Razor COVID-19 special. Stay safe, watch that social distancing, but please most importantly look after each other and we'll see you again next time.